Father, on Pentecost Sunday, we recognize that that moment that your spirit blew through the room, eyes were opened, understanding was revealed. And Lord, I pray for that for us this morning. As we read through your word, as we, as we uh, take up the teaching, Lord, we pray that uh, eyes are opened and understanding is given. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is still morning, isn't it? Good. Morning. Sorry, I've realised I've not said good morning really to anybody other than passing. There's not been sort of a hi. <sighs> Well, guess what? We didn't make it all the way through 1 Corinthians, did we? Seven. So we got the other half, and I did say there are a number of questions I'll be asking through this particular one, and, and that is uh, almost true. So um, I hope you're prepared for them. But the first question of all, what did we learn last Sunday? Now, we didn't do very well because a good five-week gap had gone past between the last time I taught and this time. Now... Only one week has gone by. So your memory should be vastly better. What did we learn last week? I'm not looking at the notes, okay? I don't, the fact you took notes, Dennis, is fantastic. Do not worry. If you want to look at your notes, go right on ahead. Um, church leaders are God's servants, not churches. Okay, that's what we learned ages ago. Thank you. And I recapped us last week. Thank you, Dennis. That's brilliant. No, I like that memory. I, I have to remind myself of that on a regular basis. So what did we actually learn about last week's teaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 7? In marriage, men and women are equal. Amen. There should be a massive amen. In marriage, both man and woman are equal. Can we keep the amen going? In marriage, man and woman are equal. Amen. No, it's the men are all going, mm -mm, silent. Ooh, better not say amen. Right. Amen. That's how it becomes equal. Right. I better be careful. You could be so accused of sexism, and I don't wish to be accused of that ever. Carlene. Did you learn something by day? Oh, come on. Well, you need to learn this stuff. <laughs> well, she's getting married in two weeks' time. I just said a joke to Carlina Mangina. That when Trust me, that's what you need to learn is joking in marriage. It works. That when it comes to the time, it's not good to say that you have a he headache. <laughs> Amen. Record that particular moment for Deji, everybody. Right, moving on. By the way, if it helps you, I have asked by a day, I asked her permission last week if during this teaching I could actually just use her as a little bit of a foil, and she said yes. I was twisting her arm at the time, but she did say yes. So I'm not going to. But you're right, excuses, it's about, that particular is about actually uh, uh, refusing your partner, who, whichever the side it is, from sexual relations. Paul is saying, actually, that's the wrong thing to do. You're not allowed to defraud your partner from sexual relations with you. So if you're in a marriage. We are now going to move on, though, in this teaching. Oh, yes, no, the other key teaching was remaining as you were called, remaining where you are when God called you. You know, that thing of in your workplace, Suddenly, all of a sudden, we think, oh, I want to get out because I've now become a Christian and I want to do something more worthwhile. And God said, well, no, I placed you there for a reason. I called you why you were there. It's there that you can be my witness. It's there that you can be my priest. It's there that you can be my minister. It's there that you can minister to those who do not know me. Remain where you are. God will always make it very clear when it's time for you to move. Trust me. I gave you my own example last week. And I'm sure there's plenty of others in the room here have their own. So, are you ready to carry on and finish chapter 7? I know it's the bank holiday Monday. And I know we'll rather be doing this in the open air. Because it is nice out there. But you're ready to finish. Yes. Wonderful. Now, says Paul, 
verse 25 to 28. Regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married. Heads up, by day. I do not have a command for the Lord from them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted and I will share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. Amen by a day. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles. And I'm trying to spare you those problems. Seems to be a lot of silence. So obviously, the Corinthians have written a letter to, to Paul um, querying something in regards to uh, marriage of their young women. Some translations have it as virgin women, which should be more likely what's going to happen. In those times, the women, if they weren't married, unless they were prostitutes, were actually still virgins. It was only the men who seemed to not be virgins by the time they were getting married, because within the Roman culture, by the time you reached about 12, apparently you should have had or be working towards having sexual relations as a man. I'm only telling you as it is in its time. So the problem was, within Corinth, there was some teaching around having the ascetic lifestyle, i.e., in this particular case, no sex, don't have sex at all, abstain from it because it's so rife in the city to be completely and utterly uh, uh, different from the people that live in the city who aren't Christians, stop having sex. You've got to show a completely different lifestyle. And that was the sort of teaching that appeared to be going on. We actually have it in some cultures here today, is this sense of, well, because within certain cultures maybe uh, abuse of alcohol is just far too big, that actually the church says, remain, if you become a Christian, you stop drinking. I'm not saying that that's wrong, yes or no, I'm just giving you an example that I know happens today. And therefore then, so you look completely different. So therefore, then there's sort of outside evidence of Jesus working in your life. Do you, do you get the point? So this is the teaching that the Corinthian church were uh, giving around having no sex. So therefore, then clearly Paul's written about this. And what Paul was actually saying was, just don't fall into the trap in the city of falling into their total lifestyle, i.e. sex outside of marriage or sex with prostitutes. It wasn't saying don't have sex at all inside of marriage. But clearly the teaching was going slightly awry. And then clearly the Corinthians are going, well, okay, what about our young women that are about to be married? Are you saying they should not be married anymore then? We should stop that. Hence this letter. Or the question that they've posed to Paul. And Paul is now saying, well, I do not have a direct command from the Lord. You'll notice in the earlier teaching, Paul made it very clear when it comes down to marriage and what about divorce, etc. I've heard from the Lord on this. It would have been the teaching that he would have heard via Jesus, not directly, but he would have heard from what they told him, how Jesus had taught and the command that Jesus had taught them. And so he knows that. But of course, Jesus didn't cover every single little minute moment in society, did he? If he did, we'd know whether we are allowed to drive cars or not. Clearly, I believe the Lord would want us to drive cars all the time. I hope so, anyway. Right. I don't know. I'm just hoping he does. So, here's a question for you. Paul is saying that he's got no direct command from the Lord. So, if we do not hear directly from the Lord when we have questions, how do we know what to do? And that's a real question. I'll go Andy first and then Fiona. Sorry, thank you. Find somebody you trust as a Christian, a mature Christian, and share it with them and work, try and work it out. 
Fiona's going to say the same thing. All right, find a trusted friend, trusted, mature Christian. I assume you're talking spiritually mature, not necessarily age. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Just ask God, pray, ask God, and yeah. Okay, ask God and pray. So you expect to hear from God audibly, directly, at every time? No, I think sometimes um, there can be some consequences or something that might happen that God might give you signs. You can ask for signs, and then God might um, give you signs of, you know, to give you wisdom, or you can ask for wisdom, is the other way. Wisdom. Thank you. Anybody else? Look in scripture, are there some principles in scripture around your issue? Your issue might not be there, driving cars, but there are some principles there which will guide our life, which might help us make that decision. Thank you, Denzel. So for example, driving cars might not be so straightforward because of the carbon footprint. I agree. Believe you me, it goes across my mind all the time. That's why I have lots of trees in my garden. And um, I think God speaks to me through peace. So sometimes when I'm trying to make a decision about something, I just have a peace about the right thing. And if it's not quite right, I just don't feel settled. I just don't have peace about it. I'm going to push you. Because sometimes you can have what you believe to be peace about something. Because each person is different. How God does communicate with us in various different ways. But you can have what you believe is peace about something. But actually, it's not really. It's you've decided this is what I want. I think deep down, when you know you've kind of, it's a fake piece, you kind of know that you're not settled and you kind of get that niggly conviction that this is not right. So it's, I think I do have true peace when it is right and when it's not right, I just feel like a niggly feeling that by the you, you really shouldn't be doing this or this is not the right path to take. So it's about we really should know our self and our own relationship with God and the maturity of our relationship. As Andy was saying, we're going to somebody who's spiritually mature, who actually knows their own relationship. We know when we're ignoring that niggling voice, don't we? So it's just linking on to what Baide said <clears throat> about peace. Peace is not, the peace she's referring to is not the same as our feeling it's all right or being, oh yeah, I'm happy with that decision. It's about a spiritual discernment so you pray for the Holy Spirit to guide you so that's the kind of peace she's referring to so if you ask God for something and you ask him hey, God please show me the way and you pray about it with a true heart then that peace you feel is the Holy Spirit almost confirming that that's the correct thing and it's a bit different from just feeling like yeah I feel happy doing that yes that's the distinct difference thank you Um, Jesus said, oh, God's word says, <clears throat> thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a guide unto my path. If we need to seek God, just go to his word. And just as Jesus spent time with God alone, maybe we have to spend time alone with God and he can give you that answer. Okay, thank you. There are multiple ways of hearing from God, but when it's not a direct command there's not a clear clear direction i agree we need to go initially to the word of god the bible and see as denzel said if there are some principles there are some clear principles we need to work towards them and later on we are going to come to one particular principle that is clearly evident like no sex outside of marriage clearly biblical principle yet somehow in our society today that seems to have been gone and we say oh that's society well that also happens in the churches so you can't suddenly say oh well the Lord said it's okay this doesn't you've not heard directly from the Lord so here in this particular case Paul is saying well I've not heard, how do I answer the question? Well, we're going to go through that now. And the key phrase for me is verse 26. Because of the present crisis. Hmm, what does that mean? What 
crisis. Because sometimes, you said, our situations have not got a direct command in the Bible. But we would need to do a balance between, well, here is the problem. It's not in the Bible exactly, specifically in answering that question. So how do I look at it? So first and foremost, we need to look at the crisis. So what crisis is Paul talking about? Well, there's three potential options, and I will go through them with you very quickly. Historically, it could well be that there was a a, a rice shortage. There was a famine issue actually within the Roman Empire at this point. And therefore then, the present crisis to remain as you are so that you do not take on any extra burdens, like extra mouths to feed. Don't end your marriage, because you would then have a struggle, because you need to find somewhere to live. And if you've got to return back to some family members, you're going to give them an extra burden of giving them an extra mouth to feed. If you take on board a wife or a, 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 or a husband, or there's two that come together, the responsibility falls upon you now to actually help out the other person and get them fed. And another home needs to be set up. And of course, if you're married, what then happens? You eventually may produce children. More mouths to feed. If there's a famine going on, this is where Paul could be saying that, you know, the present crisis, remain as you are. There was also persecution of the Jewish nation at this point, was fairly rife. And don't forget, some of the church were Jewish. Now today, we know the distinction between I'm a Christian and I'm a Jewish person, yes? Back then, no distinction. Christianity, or the way, as it was known, taken from Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the way, which is seen as another part of the Jewish sect. So it's no good sitting there going, oh, but look, I've got a cross around my neck, because I didn't do them then, all right? So that could have been the present crisis, is maybe there was some persecutions, you shouldn't be taking anybody else on, you don't want to give them extra worry about whether you're going to get chucked in prison or killed or whether or You know, don't take that burden on. But quite frankly, that view is a little bit unlikely. There's also another problem. In verse 29, and we're going to come to that in a moment, Paul talks about the time being short. Now, is that Jesus coming back? Is that what Paul means? Well, there is some fairly clear understanding amongst scholars that Paul, in his early writing like Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, might have been under some misapprehension that Jesus was returning back in Paul's lifetime. And you can understand where he might well have got this from, because in Matthew 16, 28, though Matthew wouldn't have been written then, but would have heard the teaching that Jesus says, and I tell you the truth, some standing right here will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You know, remember when the temple and they said, oh, wow, look how magnificent. And Jesus said, do you think that's magnificent? Time is coming, actually, when all these stones will not be standing on one top of the other. When's it going to happen? Some are standing here today and you will see it happen. And they took that as meaning, oh, when Jesus returns, he's going to return in our lifetimes. He said, actually, this generation won't pass away until it happens. There could have been that misunderstanding. So maybe the crisis that Paul is talking about is Jesus' return. But then again, the concept of Paul seeing that as a crisis doesn't really hold particularly true. The end answer is we don't really know what Paul totally meant. But it is, we think, around the famine period. And so therefore that's the most likely scenario that he is talking about, is that there was clearly lack of food, uh, lack of provision. So therefore then, given these current signs and times, Best not to marry. Or if you are married, don't seek to get divorced because you just, you just need to be together as one unit at the moment. If you've got a home set up, if you've got plans set up, you can feed each other. Now that's how Paul was hearing, using wisdom, because it's sort of logical really, isn't it? There's a sense of that makes sense in this particular scenario. So there are ways of hearing from the Lord. But I will say this, you must always come back to the Bible 
And I would believe that whatever you hear from the Lord, you think you've heard on your own, you need to go and test it with, as Andy said, a trusted, mature friend. Always. Must test these things. Never do anything without sort of testing it. Major decisions, I think, you should always test. Do you agree with me? Good. So, verses 29 to 31. But let me say this, dear brothers and sisters. The time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives, sorry, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them for this world as we know it will soon pass away. Three very bizarre, isolated verses in the whole of the letter. Can you remember one of the main reasons that Paul was writing this letter to the Corinthians was to give them a bigger picture of their life. They were so much about themselves and demanding their rights that they never got the God bigger picture. They never saw their situation with a concept of end times. Jesus is returning. This life is but fleeting. With me? So therefore then, bearing that in mind, what does Paul mean in these three verses? Real question. So those with wives should not focus on their marriage. Right. What does that mean then? Excellent. I have a wife. Does that mean I just don't focus on her? It says those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. So... That means that, obviously, your marriage is still important, but then what God calls in your life is way more important. And in the verse, when you look at all the things that people look to, so possessions or um, the different things are mentioned, they're all important, but it says that in this time, focus on what God wants for you rather than those things that you hold to be important to you. Thank you. I think that wraps it up for me. You should... Focus on, have you one eye on what God wants to do and one eye on your present day? The Corinthians were far too often, I think, absorbed by their present day. What was happening that day? So you're right. Those with wives shouldn't focus only, and those with husbands, by the way, shouldn't only focus on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed always by their weeping, shouldn't be always absorbed by their joy, should most certainly not always be obsessed with their possessions. Can we note in verse 31 that the things of this world, we are permitted to use them. Do you see that? Which, if I put it up, you will do. Those who use things of this world should not become attached to them. You're allowed to use them, but don't become so attached to them that you're not willing to let them go. With me? Because there's always this... Uh, modern technology, the latest phone, and notice I am keeping sort of, you know... Um, Name brands out of the conversation. We seem to get wrapped up in them. Oh, I'll have the latest one, the next edition. Because it's going to do something extra. What's that then? I don't know, but they tell me it will do. 
It's got a slight curve on the bottom. Oh, I've given away one. It's got a slight curve on the bottom. Oh, I'll have that one then. That's getting obsessed by possessions. But it doesn't mean we can't use mobile phones. Quite frankly, the way our society is going, you can't live without one now. People always want to communicate by them. Your maps are by them. You're searching on the internet by them these days. You're allowed to use them, but don't get obsessed with them. Don't hang on to it like some dear possession that your whole life has become completely traumatised because it's gone missing. Oh, there's half giggling. That tells me something. Those who weep or those who rejoice. Now, there is always a time for sorrow. There is always a time for rejoicing. What I think Paul is trying to get at, there is a point that actually, a point at some point, and it's not like tomorrow, it could be a couple of years from now, it could be whatever else, but to get so wrapped up in it that that's all you ever do. You're either always really happy or you're always really weeping. And actually, I think when you're so always happy, I think you ignore people around you who have got problems. You sort of want to avoid, because this is not happy as in joy in the Lord. This is like, life is great. Everything's wonderful for me. Oh, sorry, not for you. Oh, well, I can't deal with that because life is great for me. Do you see the difference? And you can be the upper way, so sad all the time, that basically every time you, um, and I'm trying to be really cautious about this, because this is one of these hard emotions to sort of pastorally deal with, but it, you're always. Now, you could have a really hard life situation at the moment, and that is fully understandable. But it could be something that's happened 20 odd years ago that somehow you'll not seem to be able to get over, and you're not allowing the law to work in that. And Paul is saying there's a bigger perspective here. Try and put that into some of the picture. That might help you. And again, I come back to the fact that I did last week. Blanket pastoral teaching like this is really not helpful when each person has their own individual circumstances. So with each person, all our circumstances are different. And therefore then, don't walk out of here thinking, oh, right, well, I... Pastor Warren said, I've got to get over something that happened 25. Does he have any idea how bad it was? Yes, he might well do, and he's not talking about you. Because as I said, each situation is different, okay? You with me? Okay. But I would say here that Paul is having a go at them because they live by their daily emotions. So it's depending upon how they're feeling on that day, depends on how they are. Have they been boosted up over the last couple of days by somebody? They're really happy. But the minute something bad happens, a little minor thing, oh, that's pulled me right down that as I'm really miserable now. That's not having a long-term perspective. That's running on your emotions. And the Corinthian church, I think, spent half their life running on their emotions on how they felt for the day. For us today, it could be retail therapy. I'm only feeling good today because I've gone out to the shops and I bought this. Oh, I've got this new jacket or something. But that's fleeting, isn't it? That has no long-term perspective on your joy in the Lord. And I would say people that run like that have what I call a very short-term memory. They don't have the long-term perspective. Okay. Verse 32 to 35. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. 
But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married, who has never been married, can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Part of this for Paul is actually he is trying to get at the fact that don't get wrapped up in the idea of getting married. Don't be so focused on the desperation to be married that you're not actually thinking about anything else. Don't forget, culturally for them, you need to be married. At some point, you need to be married. It was shame and, and all that if you wasn't married. So you shouldn't get wrapped up in the idea. And he's saying, well, so stay single. You'll have no such worries. You'll have no concerns about looking after somebody else. You won't have to worry about looking after your partner and keeping them happy. You won't have to worry about making sure that you've got the birthday card on time. You won't have to worry about that you've written it out on time. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I mean, that's a frivolous thing. But he's saying, ah, stay single. You'll have no such worries. There's nothing for you to worry about if you remain single. Now, it's at this point, I'm not going to be frivolous because... It has to be recognised that the Lord has sometimes asked people to remain single. And it could seem so simple from this teaching that remaining single is an absolute peach. Your life will be wonderful. You have nothing to worry about. Well, I can't speak from that perspective and there are people in this church who would be able to speak from that perspective and I'm sure that they would say to you that it has not been without its agony it's not been without its pros and its cons but Paul is saying actually those who are single can remain focused on the Lord do we think that's true? That's a real question. Thank you, Denzel. It's not necessarily so. He's saying there's the opportunity. But actually, as a single person, one of the things you don't have a husband to worry about but actually everything in life you have to worry about because there's no one else to share your decisions, the things of running a house, all those kind of things. Actually, a lot of your time as a single person can be diverted away from the Lord because there's no one else to share those things with. So it's not quite so straightforward. Thank you. It's not always easy. I can tell you about the married lifestyle. I could, but I come back to the fact I'm not ready to meet Lord Jesus yet. Da, 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 da. Moving on. Um, sorry? I'm always ready, Rangina. Just, just, I want to go my way. <laughs> oh, 
I love. Right. Um, what Paul is really trying to say, it, it is not a sin if you get married or if you don't get married. Don't forget, he's still trying to work on the fact that he's not got a direct command from the Lord. He's working these things through. And he's saying, I'm saying this for your benefit. I don't want to place restrictions on you. And I think that's part of the problem. The Corinthian church just took something and took it as a blanket rule for all of them. This idea of staying away from society, they took it as a blanket rule for all of them, no matter what their individual circumstances were. And as I said, that you can't ever do. It is never a direct command from the Lord. Sometimes you have to work through each person's pastoral situation bit by bit with them. Where are they at? Why are they there? What's happening? Do you see what I mean? And that's what Paul's trying to do here. So he's trying to say, look, if you're single, I reckon you could spend more time serving the Lord because you're not so distracted. But as Denzel's quite rightly said, that is not strictly true. I think we've got to remember that Paul was incredibly zealous that man was single focused. Each person has their own situation. But he's saying, I want you to have as few distractions as possible. So if you're somebody who can control yourself sexually, remain single. You'll have less distractions. You won't have to worry about pleasing your partner. But if you're somebody who can't, and remember, it's all a gift from God, whether you're being single or married, he's saying, well, then don't get wrapped up in your sexual lust. Go get married. Less distraction for you then. You won't be so focused here and always trying to get sex that at least you've married and partnered up and there is the opportunity for you. You see the difference? And there are people who can remain solely for the Lord single and there are others who can't. They do need a partner to keep them going. Verse 36, but if a man thinks that he's treating his fiance improperly and will inevitably, inevitably, and will inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It is not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and therefore is no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiance does well, and the person who doesn't marry does even better. We'll come back to that. Oh, okay. We clearly need to come back to that. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single, and I think I'm giving you counsel from the God spirit when I say this. Right. Oh, well, I might as well ask the question. What do we think he means by does better? Verse 38. So a person who marries his fiance does well, and the person who doesn't marry does even better. What do we think he means? It's a real question. There was a lot of mumbering, so people have clearly have opinions about that line. Of your learning. Perhaps he's talking about self-control. Okay. Maybe he's talking about himself because he's single, so he thinks that being single is better. Okay. But if we remembered from last week's teaching, he's single now. <clears throat> there was a possibility that Paul originally was married. He couldn't have been part of the Sanhedrin uh, discussion if he wasn't married. It must be going back to what he was talking about earlier about the focus. You can keep the focus on God. If you're, if you're married, then obviously you've got other focuses, whereas if you're not married, you can um, spend more time focusing on God. So that's why you must do better. Okay. Come on, there was definitely a lot more mumblings going on. The 
The bizarre thing is that actually saying that Paul originally, it's because you can be solely focused on the Lord. It's like you will do better because you will have less distractions. But there is also something else here that's very different in this passage. When he talks about the fiancé who's treating his fiancé improperly, then he may need to marry her. What appears to be going on, this crisis that's happening, this famine, is people are actually delaying maybe delaying getting married, consummating the marriage. You know, there's two sections. There's the, we are engaged, betrothed. Remember Mary, uh, Mary and Joseph? Betrothed. Effectively, they were married. But the actual marriage ceremony hadn't actually happened, so they couldn't actually consummate the marriage in, in sexual relations. So there is two distinct differences. So therefore then culturally there is this understanding that there is a certain time period you get engaged, betrothed, and then by a certain point you must be married. And there was a, a sort of a society understanding. Well, if you delayed it beyond the deadline, you were treating your fiancé improperly. And there was this sort of worry about uh, shame and uh, that sort of culture that says well you're, you're stretching this out you, you should be marrying don't, don't delay this anymore now get on with it and so of course the, the the person the man who can make the ultimate decision is actually now maybe at that point where people are starting to mistreat him and look at him wrongly it's almost Paul is saying what Paul is saying here you shouldn't worry about what society thinks. You're doing something for the Lord. Maybe the Lord has made it very firm in your mind not to get married because of the present crisis. God is about to pull you onto something else. Shouldn't worry about what society or family views are. You've got to remain focused on the Lord. You with me? So actually, the person who doesn't marry does even better, is actually do better because they're actually doing God's work. They've decided not to worry about getting married or not married. They're just doing what God's calling them to do. So the person who might well have been engaged then sort of says, no, not yet, is actually doing better because they're listening to God. They're understanding the signs of the times. You with me? So it's not quite as simple as, well, if you remain single, you're doing better. It's to do with listening to God's voice compared to the culture and society. There's a slight difference here. Paul is saying neither of these things are a sin. It's what God is saying to you. In our society today, it can tell you you can do just about anything you pretty much well want. Whenever you want to. But not everything's beneficial. And so sometimes we'll do things that society will go, oh, why are you doing that? Well, because God's told me. Oh, you don't have to be that restrictive on your life. You can do this. You can do whatever you want. And we worry far too much about what society thinks of us. Paul is saying he wants to go back to the sanctity of marriage as he does in verse 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. Only if he loves the Lord. Paul is clearly here talking to anybody who might be a widow and he's saying that, um, well, you know, you're bound to your husband until they die. But if they do, then you can actually go and remarry. But only if the person you want to marry loves the Lord. 
It might well have been there were previous partners, they had come to Christ and their husband, who wasn't a Christian, died not being a Christian. And so therefore they think, well, that's okay, I can go and marry a non-Christian because I was married to a non-Christian while I was a Christian. But they only came to know Christ whilst they were married. And Paul is saying, now there is a difference. You actually have to take up a Christian partner, somebody who knows the Lord. Paul makes this incredibly clear. Don't date a non-Christian. Paul makes it very, 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 very clear. Why? Because you get distracted. If you're dating, notice I'm using the phrase today, dating, not marrying at the moment. If you're dating a non-Christian, you will be pulled away from the Lord. You will be compromised. And I am saying this quite clearly as someone who has spent enough years as a Christian watching it happen. Seeing the Christians are totally zealous for the Lord, the minute a new Christian partner comes in their life, they start compromising. I will be very clear and I will be very robust about this. There is no ifs, buts or maybes. Compromises start to happen. And it happens both to the male and the female. So let's make it quite equal, because remember, the rule equal, amen? And these compromises happen. Because somehow, the Christian wants to start pleasing the non-Christian. Okay, yeah, you're right. Oh, let's do that on Sunday. I won't go to church. And then the next Sunday. And all of a sudden, four Sundays in a row have gone away. And then the prayer life seems to start wavering a little bit. Why? Because maybe we know we're starting to do things with our non-Christian partner that maybe God's not happy with. And Paul wants to make it very clear here. Just because you were once married to a non-Christian, you are now with the Lord. So you have to do some of the things that the Lord wants you to do. In this case, marry a fellow believer because then you will be of the same mind, zealous for the Lord. Don't get me wrong. We, well, no, get me wrong. I don't care, really, um, quite frankly. Because, you know, it can be very easy when the non-Christian is saying, oh, gosh, you go to church. Oh, that's lovely. And they sound really sympathetic to the idea. And they may not intentionally want to pull you away from Jesus. But slowly over time, that rose because they don't have the same focus as you. And I know we hear the fact that, well, actually, I start bringing them to church. They might become a Christian through me. That might well be true, but I've got to say, in 20 plus years as a Christian, my experience has been that happens maybe about 1% of the time, maybe. If you really like someone and you want them, actually get them first to come to the Lord. Don't force them, but get them, introduce them to God. Because if God wants that to be your lifelong partner, he will ensure that they come to know Jesus. Then you can start dating. Then you can marry. You can see I get quite upset up about this because I've seen far too many great Christian people, really zealous for the Lord, fall away and compromise their Christian walk and compromise what they can do for the kingdom. So if you know someone who is maybe currently in that situation, point them to this passage, please. Warn them. Not nastily, out of love. I'm doing this out of love because... Anyway. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> I'm going to conclude this whole 1 Corinthians 7. Because there's one thing for this passage that has become very defined for me, and I hope it has for you. There is not a one-size-fits-all to all pastoral circumstances. I wish there was. My job would be really easy. I would just go, aha, chapter 7, section 3, subsection B, states... 
This is how we answer this question. Ah, in the book of Revelation, God made it very clear about cars. Excuse me, we'll just turn to that. If you drive a five-liter Mustang, you are sinning. But if you are driving a 1.6 Mini, you're truly blessed by the Lord. Please. I can only pick on my own car, because if I picked on anybody else's, I'll get slated later. No, but I'm serious. There is not a one-size-fits-all. And remember, the Bible was written into a particular time at particular circumstances. You know, and these are individual letters, individual books, individual time periods. So when we are looking at our pastoral circumstances, when we're looking at answers from the Lord, we have to take the whole lot in one big package. What happens in each individual church, family? God will use each family different from another family because of their circumstances, because of their location. It's never a one-size-fits-all. And that was the problem here with the Corinthians. They took one section of a letter that Paul wrote and they just assumed that applied to each and every single one of them. And Paul's saying, no. There are certain commands he gives to all the churches he is part of. But each church, he applies what he believes is God's wisdom. So do not walk out of here today thinking, I've just been hammered. Because your personal circumstances will be different from the person next to you and the different one that Paul was talking about. Okay? It's very clear to me. So we have to, that's why we are together as a family. That is why we, we spend time together. That's why we lift up things together in prayer. That's why we talk to each other and say, what do you think God is saying in this situation? That's why I meet with people. And I don't always hear directly from the Lord. Times I do. There's other times I go, let's discuss this out, shall we? Let's see if we can pick up what the Spirit is saying together. And we're all like that. But there are certain things in the Bible that makes it very clear that are timeless. As I said to you, there are things that Paul says, I say this to all the churches, that's never going to change. Whatever happens, that does not change. And there are certain situations that are timeless, like sex outside of marriage. Each circumstance, each circumstance should hold to this one point for me. And this should be the primary question to everything we do. And it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And I said to you right from the beginning, I believe this is true for the whole letter. This is almost like the, the twisting verse. Does this bring glory to God? Because 1031 says, do everything to the glory of God. So in all your decisions, is this going to bring glory to God? Not to myself, not to my own circumstances, not to make me happy. I'll buy that new jacket in yellow because it makes me happy. I haven't bought a new jacket in yellow, by the way. But does it bring glory to God? That's always the primary question. In companies, their primary question is, what will this do for the bottom line? Will it improve the profits? Yeah? It's like the suggestion box. We want to hear from the staff, our employees. Here's the suggestion box. We really want to hear your views. We want to know how you're feeling. We want to see. No, we want to see if you're going to come up with something that's going to improve the bottom line. In all our decisions, in all our pastoral circumstances, will this bring glory to God? Glory. 
Lord, we spent this morning worshipping. We sung that song, shape me, mould me. And that's all about, Lord, bringing glory to your name. Working for your kingdom, knowing full well we all fit perfectly into your plan for the redemption of the world. So, Lord, I do pray for all of us in all of our circumstances, be they really happy ones, be they really sad ones. Lord, as we seek answers from you, what to do next. Lord, I pray that we recognize that first and foremost, we need to ask, is it part of your redemption plan? Is this going to be something that's going to bring glory to your name? When it says that you care about every single hair that's on our head, it means you care about us as individuals, but you always have the bigger plan involved. Help us to see that as we walk on our daily lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.